Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about how to examine these patients with altered mental status. Again, there are a lot of nuances to examination and this lecture is by no means complete, but hopefully it will give you some understanding into how to proceed. There are a lot of good videos on how to perform these tests. Our role is mostly to put them all together. This is an outline of how to evaluate a comatose patient. There is a general physical examination that we perform on all patient and there is a neurological examination. In general physical examination, pay attention to vital signs, look for signs of trauma, examine skin carefully and observe for movements and posture. In neuro exam, always go in order, perform a GCS, examine eyes and then cranial nerves followed by muscle tone, reflexes, Babinski, meningeal sign, and fundoscopy. Simple things like looking at the blood pressure can give you some idea about the underlying etiologies. Patients with high blood pressure may possibly have posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or hypertensive encephalopathy. Patient with ICH and stroke can have high blood pressure as well. Hypotension is mostly seen in patients with shock they may have underlying hemorrhage or drug abuse. Endocrine disorders like mixed edema and adrenal crisis can lead to lower blood pressures. Fever is not always caused by infection, though it is the commonest cause. Think about other reasons, for example, medications and drugs. Patients with serotonin syndrome, salicylate overdose, cholinergic poisoning can have fevers. Patients with intracerebral hemorrhage, especially pontine and subarachnoid, can have fever as well. Hypothermia, apart from sepsis, which is the commonest reason, can be seen in endocrine disorder, for example, hypoglycemia, myxedema, adrenal crisis. Patients with drug overdose, especially alcohol and sedatives, can have lowered body temperature. Environmental exposure can result both in hyperthermia and hypothermia. Don't forget to examine skin thoroughly. Look for signs of trauma. Observe for rashes and track marks. And observe extremities, especially the nail beds. Signs of trauma include bruising around eyes, which is raccoon eyes. Bruising around mastoid, which is battle sign. Examine your tympanic membrane and you may be able to find hemotympanum. Look for ecchymosis and look for signs of CSF rhinorrhea. You can see halo sign, which would suggest that patient might have CSF leak. Petechia and purpura can be a bit confusing. Petechia are nothing but pinhead size macules, less than three millimeters, while purpura are larger size macules, and both are not blanched by application of pressure. Both of them can be seen in thrombocytopenia and vasculitis, and certain infectious diseases. Don't forget to turn patient and examine their back as you might miss certain important findings. Make sure that look for needle marks. Observe for abnormal movements such as seizure, myoclonus. Look for facial asymmetry and see if patient is preferentially using one side compared to other. Observe for abnormal posture and two important posture to know are decorticate and decerebrate posturing. Decorticate posturing, that means your cortical areas are not functioning. So any lesion above the red nucleus, that means cerebral white matter, internal capsule and thalamic lesions will have decorticate posturing. Deep cerebrate posturing is seen in lesions lower than red nucleus. And the difference between them is look at the upper extremities in decorticate posturing, the arms are adducted and flex against the chest. And in decerebrate posturing, the arms are straight and extended. Understand that these are just signs of neurological injury rather than a diagnosis. Observe the respiration of your patients carefully. Most of the time, patients are already on the ventilator, which limits the utility of this. However, you can still use it if the patient is not on controlled mode of ventilation. That means patient is on spontaneous breathing. Kusmal breathing is seen in metabolic acidosis. In this patient respiratory rate and tidal volumes are pretty high. Keen Stokes breathing, which is alternating hyperventilation and hyperventilation, 
is seen in bilateral cerebral dysfunction and basal ganglion lesions. Central neurogenic hyperventilation, where patient is breathing very rapidly at 60 to 70 times a minute, is seen in midbrain lesions. Pontine lesions have characteristic slow breathing followed by prolonged inspiratory hold. This is apneustic breathing. Cluster breathing, which is brief bursts of breath followed by pause, or ataxic breathing, which is very irregular in frequency and amplitude, can suggest impending herniation. Next, perform a GCS. Understand that GCS is mostly non-diagnostic, but gives you the depth of coma and helps following up these patients. There are a lot of good videos on how to perform a GCS. The common errors that I see is not performing both central and peripheral painful stimuli to observe for response. Make sure that you have exposed upper and lower extremities when you perform the painful stimuli to observe for any slightest of motions. Next, check for muscle tone and reflexes. Usually increased tone will result in, in hyperreflexia and if the patient is very hyperreflexic, you should be able to elicit clonus. The way to think about tone and reflexes is your spinal cord is under constant suppression from brain. So any damage to the higher brain function, that is upper motor neuron disease, will result in disinhibition and hyperreflexia. Hyperreflexia can also be seen in patients who are using stimulant drug and with serotonin syndrome. Hyperthyroidism, hypocalcemia and lithium overdose can also result in hyperreflexia. Hyporeflexia, on the other hand, results from damage to your lower motor neuron. That means your reflex arc. And it is most commonly seen in metabolic encephalopathy. Patients with hypothyroidism and hypermagnesemia can also have hyporeflexia and flaccidity. Babinski reflex tests the integrity of corticospinal tract, which is your motor tract. There is an inhibitory tone from corticospinal tract in the spines because it wants to prevent the spread of the stimulus to the other nerve roots. So for example, if you stimulate the lateral aspect of foot, you stimulate at S1 level, and this will result in a stimulation of tibial nerve, which will cause plantar flexion or maybe no response. However, if your corticospinal tract is damaged, the stimulus from S1 can spread up to L5 and L4, and this can stimulate deep peroneal nerve, which can result in dorsiflexion or extension of big toe, and also sometimes results in fanning of the other toes. This is positive Babinski reflex. Meningeal signs are not very helpful because it's difficult to assess pain in comatose patient. Also, neck stiffness can be absent in these patients. However, if the signs are present, it may suggest meningitis or subarachnoid hemorrhage. Fundoscopy is an integral part of evaluation of altered mental status, so make yourself familiar with this. You can see papilledema, which can be seen in elevated ICP, or retinal hemorrhage, which can be seen in subarachnoid hemorrhage. We'll talk about examination of eyes and cranial nerves in the next lecture. In summary, make sure that you perform a general physical examination, paying stress on vitals, skin, signs of trauma, and abnormal movement and posture. And when performing neurological examination, go in order, perform your GCS, evaluate eyes and cranial nerves, followed by muscle tone, reflexes, Babinski, and then fundoscopy. Once you perform these steps regularly, you will slowly get better at it. These are the references. Thank you.